Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zanyagulu. Now, it's 100 days since the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan, and the Red Cross says more Afghan people will die unless other countries stop withholding funds from the Taliban administration. Almost 23 million people live below the poverty line, and with winter closing in, the spectre of starvation stalks the land with the Taliban administration trying to run things in almost impossible circumstances. So, a hundred days on, after the US and other NATO troops left, the country is in a deep, dire mess. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by Arise News International correspondent Faith Orr. Good to see you, Faith. So, a hundred days on, lots of heartbreaking scenarios being painted about Afghanistan by aid agencies who are actually there. Tell us more about what you're hearing. Look, the country was already in trouble under the previous administration. I don't think there's any point trying to, you know, make it seem mm. like this has suddenly happened. The country wasn't looking very good to start with. You know, it had been hit badly by the coronavirus pandemic. It had been hit particularly badly by a drought, mm. which left no water to grow crops or, or, you know, provide water for livestock. But the thing that's changed is that Afghanistan was hugely reliant on international aid. Really, it had a false economy. Mm. International aid was its economy. And since the Taliban took over, that has completely dried up. Every country, every organisation has cut off funding. Mm. Now, you know, this, this means that people who were middle class, for instance, you know, their jobs were reliant on this. So the people who had a steady, stable income have suddenly been left with nothing. You know, this has just pulled the rug clean out from under them. Mm. Um, if we give one example, you know, a bricklayer would have been earning around $270 a month and now they can struggle to earn even $20 My a month. My goodness. So the economy has, has virtually collapsed. People are really, really struggling. The World Food Programme is doing one thing, they're doing direct cash handouts to people. So we're seeing queues of people lining up in places like Kabul and what they're getting is $76, but that is expected to see them through two months. And since you know the value of the currency has dropped so much against the dollar, food prices have risen, everything has risen, people are really struggling. Mm. So a fast unravelling crisis really, and, and UNICEF says it's seen a 50% increase in cases of severe acute malnutrition, which means that if you don't give children, for instance, immediate treatment, they're likely to die. I mean, that's how stark it is. Exactly. So millions of youngsters are already suffering and an estimated 3.2 million children are expected to be acutely malnourished by the end of the year. So this isn't just a handful of people here and there. These are millions and millions of children all under the age of five. Now, they are being admitted to hospital to try and save their lives. But of course, as with everything, medical supplies are running low. Mm. And that is a problem. You know, we are seeing the healthcare staff do what they can certainly these youngsters will die without treatment so healthcare staff very much doing what they can there but they've been badly affected too they haven't been paid in months they're struggling to even get to the hospital to get transport to get there they don't know where their next meal is coming from you know we've heard from some nurses who actually fear that they're going to have to be admitted for acute malnutrition, never mind treat the people there. Good God. And beyond that, I mean, just to, to further support the point you're making, the UN estimates that nearly half the country is food insecure, which means they cannot access affordable or nutritious food. And that sounds absolutely dire. I mean, millions of people are living in near famine conditions. About 24 million people, 60% uh, of the population, have acute hunger. And, you know, agencies are warning that, again, by the end of the year, 97% of the population will be below the poverty line. You know, as it stands, almost nobody has access to enough food in Afghanistan. And the problem is, again, trying to get supplies into the country mm. is a big, big problem. There's no cash. This is a very cash-reliant society. There's no cash because that has all been cut off. That cash was held in you know, US banks. None of that's getting in anymore. So this is why people just can't buy the food that they need. Mm. And, and as we mark 100 days since the Taliban took over, what does the security situation look like there? 
Security is still a problem. So you'll remember that during the Taliban takeover, there was a big attack on Kabul airport where there was dozens of casualties. Now, that was carried out by a group called uh, affiliated with Islamic State mm. called ISIL Khorasan. And mm. they existed before this takeover, I mean, around six months ago, I think it was, they bombed a girl's school. But the, the, you know, the real promise from the Taliban was that they could secure the country. That was the one thing they said they could bring was mm. security. And we've seen this group continue their attacks. They're targeting the Shia population, they're bombing mosques. There was dozens of casualties just in the past few months. We we're also seeing them directly targeting the Taliban with roadside bombs, and they've mm. managed to take out a few senior members. And, and we, we have the Red Cross saying today that unless the West changes its policy, I mean, you touched on this earlier, of withholding funds from the Taliban, we will see more deaths. I mean, so clearly a critical point. Is there any indication at all that the West is rethinking its policy on Afghanistan in order to mitigate a crisis of this magnitude? We're seeing small changes. So, for instance, um, Western Union, you know, the money transfer mm. service, it has restarted its services to Afghanistan, which makes a difference for the people there if they have relatives abroad. We're also seeing the United Nations plea for funding for Afghanistan. But the likes of the UK and the US really haven't budged at all in their position. They just don't want to be funding. And those are two the critical countries. I exactly. Aren't they? You know, they provided a lot of aid. Um, what we are seeing, actually, is countries like Pakistan, for instance, one of their neighbours, doing much more to help. Islamabad, uh, just today, has pledged $28 million in assistance for Afghanistan. And that's things like wheat will be going into the country, emergency medical supplies, mm. um, winter shelters, because, of course, so many people are in need of shelter. Um, Pakistan has also agreed with India to allow India to send food aid through its territory to Afghanistan, which is a rare event. You know, as, as we know, Pakistan and India don't always get on very well. So mm. that's a rare move for them to, to make that concession for the Afghan people. And they're also going to help Afghans who were seeking treatment in India return to Afghanistan or, or, or get to India for treatment as well. Um, so places like Pakistan doing more to help mm. and the likes of Qatar, of course, in the Middle East, doing more to help than traditional Western nations. But obviously it would make sense for them. I mean, Pakistan borders Afghanistan, and if anything goes wrong there, then obviously it's going to have a knock-on effect. But the aid agencies, um, UNICEF, the Red Cross, the UN, international NGOs, they say they have the systems in place to take money and to distribute it to people who need it the most and that money does not need to go through the de facto authorities who are essentially the Taliban. How important a message is that? I think that is important a message in terms of their, if they're trying to get donations, mm. donors might be more satisfied knowing that the money isn't going directly to the Taliban and it is going directly to the citizens of Afghanistan. You know, and we are seeing, like I said, the World Food Programme handing cash directly to people. But it does feel like this problem is bigger in scale and needs a more centralised approach. You know, more than 3.5 million people have been displaced by this fighting. Uh, in the last few years, more than half a million of them just in the last few months. Now they live in these terrible conditions, they face a daily battle just to find enough to eat and drink and conditions are only going to get worse as winter sets in, I mean temperatures can plummet in Afghanistan. So it does feel like this more centralised action needs to be taken. But the distrust of the Taliban remains, and I mean, you know, they people say, oh, they've changed, but there are still the old issues, the, you know, the lack of rights mm. for women, lack of schooling, and, and attacks, uh, you know, and punishments that they've been dishing out to people. So lots of issues still remain. Um, they've even been accused of killing a pregnant police officer, which the Taliban denies. But that does raise questions of how the Taliban is running the country and how much of a grip they really have. Faith, thank you very much indeed. Faith or Arise International correspondent there. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.